Welcome to Gotta Run. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. This is a very special episode of Gotta Run. The Wolf Pack is here. My very special guest is Sasha Wolf, and she brings her team to meet the challenges of the New York City Marathon. She describes herself as a mental health warrior. We're going to learn all about Sasha and her organization called Still I Run. Hi, thank you. Sasha, before we go into your personal story, I was checking out your website and in social media and the name of your organization that you started about six years ago, yeah. Still I Run. It's poetic. If you were going to describe yourself in three words, I could see somebody saying, Still I Run. Yep. And the image that I got was, you've probably seen this in Captain America, <laughs> where Captain America is a scrawny kid. I'm going to do something. And he's being grinded on. And he goes, I could do this all day. You know? <laughs> Still, I run. Yep. So tell us about Still I Run. What is the organization about? Yeah, Still I Run is a running nonprofit that I started about six years ago, like you said. Um, and our goal is to defeat the stigma. It's about raising mental health awareness through the act of running and also promoting the benefits of running for mental health. Okay. Is Still I Run a running club or a running based club? Both, I guess you could say. I like to say that we're a a running community, but we're also a nonprofit. So like we have the general Still I Run community. We're a bunch of mental health running warriors across the country who all run for mental health. But then we also have really awesome programming that helps people overcome any barriers they may have when it comes to running for mental health. We promote mental health awareness. So I guess it's, it's kind of both. <laughs> okay. The closest organization that, that came to mind that reminded me or what you do is, is an organization called Back on My Feet. Oh, yep. Okay. Ann Malum started that years, years ago in Philadelphia. And uh, if you know her story, she was a runner in Philadelphia and she ran past this homeless shelter on her way in a run and she would get, not cat calls, she would get, go girl, go get it. Yeah. And it reminded her of her dad. It's a long story. And she decided, well, why am I running past these guys, why don't, I don't, why don't I invite them to join me? And so she started the Back of My Feet in Philadelphia as a chapter with these homeless men, mostly men, mm -hmm. so 80% men, 20% women, and they would run. And, and again, same idea is to empower them to, to, to gain self-esteem, to gain confidence, and to agree that they wanted to leave behind homelessness and gain regain their their humanity in terms of if they were missing some set of skills, they would work with them to get, regaining those skills, regaining the licenses. Anyway, it took off tremendously. She's not a running club in the sense that, oh, they don't have speed sessions. They're not there to win awards, they're, you know, top three. Mm -hmm. They're there to win the run of their lives. You know? Yeah, yeah. But they physically meet and have running coaches or running volunteers mm -hmm. to take them out and run 5K to get them up to speed. So do you have chapters like that in different nations where people go to come together? We do, yeah. So we uh, have run chapters around the country. We launched originally in 2020, but we had to cool it a little bit because of the pandemic. So it kind of officially launched in 2021. Um, we're up to 14 chapters across the country right now. Um, and it's super exciting because Still I Run started as a virtual community, if you will. I started it on Facebook. Um, and eventually I discovered there was a real need to bring that virtual community of Still I Run to hometowns across the country. So that's kind of our, our goal with the Run Chapter piece of Still I Run is to literally have a Still I Run chapter in every state, maybe every city someday. Um, but just the fact that you can like go on vacation, do a quick search, find other mental health running warriors in your area where you're vacationing and you can run with them. That's just so exciting to me. And that's that's the direction I want to go with our run chapters. Oh, yes. We're Excellent. getting there. Excellent. Oh, so it started in 2020 as a Facebook virtual. So Well, the community did. The community, sorry, the community started in 2016. The run chapters, that oh, was okay. when I wanted to launch the run chapters oh, okay. and uh, had to slow down just a little bit there oh, because okay. of the pandemic. <laughs> 
of course, everybody. But let's talk about the logo because the logo is it's well designed. It's eye catching. It says still I run, but the eye is. At first, you think it's an italic eye. Oh, wait a minute! It's really a semicolon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so much meaning behind the tattoo. So I deal with mental health issues on my own and I took up running for my mental health and I decided to do well. My husband got me into marathon running. So I'm training for my very first marathon. I just got done with a 20 miler and I was like, I need to commemorate this somehow. I need to get a tattoo. <laughs> so I, I really was inspired by Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise and about overcoming adversity and rising above. And so I wanted to take that, that phrase of empowerment and turn it into a running phrase for myself. And I thought, still I run, that's it. And so, as you said, the, the I in it is a semicolon, which is for the semicolon project, which is a mental health organization. It's kind of a symbolic thing. So when you're writing, you can choose to end a sentence with a period, or you can continue it on with a semicolon. So the oh. whole thing is, your life is the story, continue it on. It's about kind of suicide awareness, the, the semicolon project. So that right in the middle of Still I Run combines the mental health aspect and the running aspect for me. And then it's, it's also over an arrow because I'm very big into like metaphors. And so with an arrow, before you shoot it to hit its target, you sometimes gotta go back a little, right? And then you let it go and you let it go right towards your target. So it's on my wrist. When I'm running, I can see it as I'm running, pointing me forward, still I run. It was my own personal mantra. And then I was like, that's, that's it. That's the name for the group. It was all a personal thing for me first. And then I thought, all right, well, I'm sharing this with the world. And so now Excellent. my tattoo became the name of the group. Wow, that is a <laughs> fantastic story. But okay, well, let's go back. Let's uh, introduce you to our audience. Tell us uh, where you were born and something about your growing up years. Yeah, well, I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. My dad is an anesthesiologist and he was going to school out there. So we moved around a lot when he was in school um, and then ended up in California. So I am originally a California girl and then went to school in Michigan um, and then ended up staying out there because I ended up getting a job right out of college. So it was move home to California with mom and dad and wait tables, who knows, or start a career um, in Michigan where I went to school. What did you study at school? I studied film. I'm a film studies major. And so my first job out of college, I actually um, was the weekend morning producer at uh, ABC News Channel in, in Grand Rapids, oh, Michigan. Well, that's not too shabby. No, it was a really good first job. Um, and I, I stuck with it for a couple of years, but working weekends and nights and holidays kind of got a little difficult after a while, but it was a great first job out of college. I had so much fun with it. Oh, great, great. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> Eventually, you said you had a breakdown of some sort. What happened there? Yeah, so if we go back a little bit in my history, um, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety in 2003 when I went away to college. So, you know, moving 2,000 miles away from home, being away from mom and dad, being away from everything I knew. And the school nurse diagnosed me at Calvin University where I went. And I was too afraid to really tell anyone about it. So I just took the medication that they gave me. I didn't read up on it, really. I didn't tell anyone. Uh, and I Because of the stigma. Yeah, because of the stigma. And I think it just eventually got to the point, like 10 years later, where my depression outgrew the medication I was on. Um, and I was just, everything was getting harder and harder for me. Um, I was withdrawing from friends and family. I was having a hard time at work focusing. I felt hopeless. And then just one night, I felt like, I didn't want to continue on in any way. And luckily I was with someone at the time who suggested, why don't you check yourself into a mental health hospital? We've got great services in, in West Michigan where I'm located. And so I made that, that really scary and brave decision to, to check myself into a mental health hospital for a week. Wow, like that phrase, you, you made the brave decision. One of my shows was on suicide. We had a suicide panel which is a really extreme form of uh, mental Absolutely. health issues. And one of the women attempted to uh, get in, in uh, as a young person several times to take a life. Mm -hmm. And and one of the other panelists, you know, she's cut the whole story and that uh, turned out her, her cat, at the, 
the moment she thought she finally figured out how to end her life, she had the pills, whatever she had, she was locked up in the bathroom, she was ready to go, and the cat. Meow on the door. I'm hungry. Oh, she says, I forgot to feed the cat. Anyway, she opens the door, the cat comes in, jumps on her lap, and she goes, whoa, what am I doing? Yeah. I said, so, so one of the other panelists said, so, and then she called the, uh, the suicide number, and they got her down, and she's now married, kids, coping. But one of the interesting things she said, what one of the uh, other panelists said, oh, that was very brave of you. She goes, she goes, I had to learn to be brave. Yeah. I had to learn to ask for help. It doesn't come natural. So when you said you felt brave, is that's because you learned that? Or? I learned that. I did not feel brave in that moment. It's, it's years later. It's been almost 10 years since I was hospitalized. It's taken me that long to realize that that was probably one of the bravest decisions I've ever had to make. But you had to learn it. Yeah, I did. It took me a decade to learn it. <laughs> well, that stuck to me. She had to learn it. Uh, because, you know, people f don't want to be a burden, you know. Oh, you know, this is my personal dilemma, it, whatever it is, this pain. It's different from, you know, if you've got a broken leg or broken arm, people yeah. can see it. And yeah. they, all right, we've got to take care of that. But if you've got something in your head uh, or something, you know, that's not obviously visible, something you have to talk about, mm -hmm. you have to learn it. But the other thing he was saying, you know, uh, now she has lots of friends. And she deliberately picked people that know what her condition is, that she can call them and say, hey, listen, mm -hmm. I, I think something's going on. Listen to me and it, it, see, see what's going on. Or she'll tell them, this is to watch out for, especially she's married with kids, her husband loves her and dearly and says, wants to understand what's going on. So she's developed a, a strategy, a coping strategy of, of what she needs to do because she has accepted that this, this, this is a disease that's always going to be with her. She's not going to go away. She realizes that this is like, almost like a, this, this passenger, this, this thing inside of her. And so with the, she, her language is very interesting and I wanted to get your take on it. She says she's not fighting suicide. She says she's working with it. And the reason she wants to say she's working with it and not fighting it, because if I'm fighting it, the implication is that I might lose. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I've had anxiety attacks, but not to the extent where I want to, you know, take a flying leap off a building. Yeah. Some people have done. So, so what is it about working with a disease that resonates with you? I think for me, working with it, it's a part of me. It's a chronic disease that I have, you know, much like people have diabetes or heart issues or, or blood pressure issues. Like, my mental illness is something that is a part of me and it's it's not anything that I can cure or get rid of. It's something that I, I work with <laughs> and, and I have much to, um, like you said, she's got like a strategy. I've got what I call my mental health toolkit, which is running therapy and medication. And I utilize pieces of those depending on what's going on in my life at the time. So that's that's my lifelong strategy because I'm, I'm working with my mental illness. I'm not, I'm not gonna fight against it. And I did wanna fight against it when I was younger, when I was silent for that 10 year period after being diagnosed because I, I grew up in California, like I said, so I was the fun, happy, bubbly California girl. And then like all of a sudden she gets diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I thought, wow, I am going to be such a bummer for people and they don't want to, they're not going to want to associate with me. People are going to look down on me. They're going to think I'm weak. And so that was when I started fighting it. And then after the hospitalization and getting, if you will, my head on straight and understanding that this is something that I'm going to live with, that's when I started working with it. Excellent. Were you married at that point? Or? No. So nope. marriage came in later. Marriage came in much later. All right. <laughs> so you were hospitalized, took medication, took therapy, went home, and then you saw a pair of walking shoes or running shoes and you decided. Yeah, I saw my pair of running shoes in the corner. My parents were runners. Um, and so I kind of grew up with knowing what running was all about. They didn't do races or anything, but my dad was very religious, like 5 a.m., get out, do my run. Um, and I would go with him occasionally. So. 
I knew what running was all about. I had a pair of running shoes and I saw them in the corner and I was like, I should just get outside. I, let's see what some fresh air will do. And, and when I was hospitalized, they, they preached developing a healthy habit, like reading, painting, whatever. And so I thought, all right, maybe walking slash running will be my healthy habit. Um, and getting out there the day after, it made me feel accomplished and like I had conquered something. It didn't magically make me feel better. I it didn't erase all this time that I had been dealing with mental illness, but you've got those chemical reactions going on with your brain with movement for mental health. Um, and then just the, the feeling of confidence and feeling positive that I, I started running for my mental health. I, I put the two and two together and I kept going. <laughs> I think a year later after I started that, I did a 25K because I was just hooked on it. Okay, you helped yourself because everybody says, before you can help others, make sure your own situation is stable. Yeah. So you realize, hey, maybe there are other people that I could join or work with me. How did that start? Well, I really like communities. I like connecting with individuals. I really like connecting with like-minded individuals. So I thought, if I'm doing this running thing for my mental health, there's got to be other people out there that run for the same reason. Like, this isn't a brand new thing. Sasha did not discover running for mental health. Um, <laughs> so I started looking for a group in the area, local area, that I could connect with. Could not find a thing. Then I expanded that search to Michigan could not find a thing. The nationwide, I could not find a dang thing. And I was like, well, I guess I'll, I'll start something on my own. But it sat in the back of my head for a few years because A, I was afraid because I knew if I started something, I would have to be public with my story. And then B, I didn't know what to call the group. I, I was like, what do you call a group of people running for mental health? And I came up with these really terrible names that just never would have flown marketing wise. And then when I got my tattoo, I was like, that, that is the name of this group. So I got that part taken care of. It was the actual being brave part. And I finished up a book called Daring Greatly from Brene Brown about being vulnerable. I love that woman in that book. And so after reading that book, I was inspired to just share my story and, and hope that people would be receptive to it with me being vulnerable. And hopefully that would help other people get started running for mental health, or hopefully that would help create a community of mental health runners. And so on World Mental Health Day, October 10 of 2016, I just put a Facebook page out there and a really badly designed website I made by myself with my story and that was it. You call it a community. Some people call that like a movement. Is there yeah. a difference between a community and a movement in your mind? I think a community is the collective of people the movement is, because I would love Still I Run to be a movement. I've thought about this before. So there's the Still I Run community, but I want us to be a movement of people running for mental health, like a movement that kind of sweeps the nation or an area or whatever, of, that it's just a habit of getting out there for, for mental health. Yeah, yeah. Especially in, uh, in New York City, dozens and dozens of clubs that are, that are specialties. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's Harlem Run. Yeah. What's it called Harlem Run? Well, because they run in Harlem. Yep, yep. <laughs> I, I read Allison's story in Harlem Run. Absolutely love it. And there's Latinos Run. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it called Latinos Run? Well, it's about Latinos getting them to run because, you know, the, like a lot of ethnic groups, they have uh, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, and the woman that started this. My community could do better. So it, they, they run to to improve on their health, mm. which could may perhaps include mental health, but was primarily physical. Yeah. Recently, like during the pandemic, Run for Chinatown was created out of because during the pandemic, Chinatown was particularly hit because, you know, because the virus presumably came from China and, and there was a lot of yeah. concern about going to Chinatown. And so this one guy, this worker, this cook, this guy from, from Brooklyn Tech, smart guy, he decided, I'm gonna go back to running. <laughs> I like it. And he started just to empower the business community. So there are lots and lots of movements and, and, and so forth. So the mental health thing is great. And I, I like what you said about you use drugs when needed and therapy, mm -hmm. because one of the, uh, 
because of that suicide panel, the common thread among, among the people besides having experience with suicide, either they attempted it or they had a family member, they were all runners. And of course, one of the uh, tropes of running is, oh, running is my therapy. Yeah. Running is my medicine. And, and with this person I wanted to point out, it's, it's running is great, but it's, it's not the cure Correct. for mental health concerns. Same thing with Anne Mellon when she, did, when she started running for the homeless. She's not saying, well, I'm not saying that running is going to solve the homelessness problem. <laughs> it's just going to help people get move away from homelessness yeah. and become contributing members of society, I think she should put it. I think you're on the right track. And you're growing, right? Yeah, we absolutely are growing. It's been interesting the last couple of years, really, because I, I've seen the community and the need for our group really grow since the pandemic started. Depending on where you look at your website, because at one point it says before the pandemic, 2019, one in 10 people admitted having some kind of anxiety. So much higher now. Now it's four in 10. Yep. Because of the pandemic, everybody's closed in. The, the thing is, mental health issues, it's not going to go away. No. It's just going to be here for the rest of time. So you're never going to work yourself or run yourself out of a job. No. <laughs> But what's interesting also, in the last week alone, you know, just because maybe I was more aware, there was two articles that came up about related to mental health. One was, it's to go nature walking. It's to go and listen to birds. It's to go bird oh, yeah, watching. Yeah. And I said, yeah, nature walk, because in New York, that's really, really difficult. But we have Bad Cortland Park. They have nature walks. And I've been to one, and I remember I got the the high that you get from a run from glue this picture mm -hmm. because it reminded you of being a little kid again. We were fortunate we had the birding dude with us. <laughs> and he brought along a guy who was an expert at insects. So we would walk along and he would see, you know, little rocks and whatever. And he says, look at this, pick up a rock, all sorts of creatures. And I, oh, of course we did that as a kid, but as an adult, <laughs> you go, oh, look at that. So I'm thinking, Maybe Still I Run should have workshops in terms of, hey, this weekend we're going to go out for a nature walk, cross train, to listen to some birds. That sounds amazing. I, I absolutely love running outdoors, too. I think because I'm listening to the birds and the nature sounds, and it's just amazing. Well, because I should say some people can't run, but they could probably enjoy a little stroll yep. through a nature walk. And, and it's also good for your mental health. Yep. Still I walk, still I yoga, still I hike. It could be any sort of movement as long as, it, you know, and really, you're getting out there for mental health. And the second article that came out, the effects that cats, not necessarily dogs, but the cats have a very much good effect once mental health. Of course, it reminded me of the woman who was saved by your cat. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny you bring that up because it was National Cat Day the other day. And so we posted about it on Still I Run's website or on our social media. And we're like, did you know that there are mental health properties to owning a cat? And everybody was sharing cat photos with us. They just loved it. <laughs> oh, I put mine in. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> In New York, for example, they encourage people to come into a cat shelter and, you know, pet the cats. <laughs> Maybe Michigan has that, you know, talk to, hey, can we come in and, you know, pet the cats, feed the cats, whatever. Yeah, right. Like everybody can come. Go to the shelters. Go to the shelter. Take the of dogs course, for a walk. They, of course, I got to say, oh, please, because they know a few of you are going to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a win-win situation then for everyone and the animals. <laughs> so so I, I love that idea that there's more ways to skin a cat. <laughs> yeah, there we go, yep. <laughs> My understanding is you're actually managing your marathon team. You're, you've done a marathon, but you're not going to be in New York on Sunday. Yeah, I've done four marathons. And the funny thing about the New York City Marathon, I've applied to be in the lottery seven years and I've never gotten in. <laughs> and then the first year I apply for um, Still I Run to be a charity partner, we get in. And I was so excited. I really wanted one of the bibs for myself, but it is not about me. It is about Still I Run in the Mission. So we have nine incredible runners taking to the streets for the New York City Marathon. And I'm I, just stunned. They're amazing. I'm calling them the Wolf Pack. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to tell them that. I get to meet. So we're all spread across the country. I get to meet them for our um, brunch and our shakeout run. And I am going to tell them that, that Will Sanchez says, you guys Wolfpack. are the Wolf Pack. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> it is. 
I, in addition to working at Still I Run, I also work part-time at Herman Miller Furniture, and they have graciously donated their space on the second floor of their showroom for our team. Excellent. So we have a private brunch on the second floor of the Herman Miller showroom on Park Avenue. Oh, so there's nine of you. You imply that they're from different parts of the country. Yep, we've got Jamie from California. We've got Brenda and Chris from Florida. We have Pennington from Washington, D.C. They're all over the place. So you put the call in, run for Still I Run, and it says for raising, usually it works for raising a certain amount of money. Yep. You, you get support, bibs, yada, yada, yada. So one of the goodies you get for being a, a member of Team Wolf. <laughs> Team Wolf, yes. So they ended up getting a training plan, free virtual coaching, <laughs> the team brunch, the, uh, we're doing a shakeout run plus yoga. And then we gave them team jerseys, a long sleeve and a short sleeve, because you never know what the weather's going to be like. It's going to be warm. <laughs> no, I'm so glad I gave them both options because it could have gone either way. Um, and then they got a bunch of Still I Run goodies. And then we've had some really incredible sponsors come by and, and donate items. So we had Gooder donate glasses. We had Athletic Brewing Company donate non-alcoholic beer. Um, we had Soul Footwear um, donate, like, uh, shoe footbeds. So... The team got a bunch of amazing goodies. Excellent, excellent. And it sounds like some of them will be meeting for the first time. Yeah, brunch. yes, I am so excited. We'll get to, I think everybody's pretty much meeting each other for the very first time, including my team manager. Uh, she lives in New York, but I've never met her in real life. It's always been virtual. So like meeting the Still I Run community in person, I'm so that excited is, about that it. Is, that is amazing. Put together such a diverse group. You can work together through either through social media or Zoom. That's amazing. And I didn't realize till, till actually till recently that you can have, a, well, the pandemic, of course, accelerated that. But the, the actual organizations, other charities, that the one I belong to now, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, they do something very similar. They have a marathon team. And so one of them wrote, says, hey, I'm doing the marathon in New York City. You know, if you want to help me, support me, you know, Send me a note, whatever. I said, hey, I want to interview your marathon coach on the show. The guy go, oh, we don't have a marathon coach. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, so how do you train? Oh, he says, a group of us, and we train them, um, you know, where, wherever we are. Yeah. We, we, I said, whoa. I said, that is real, real, true grit and dedication. So meeting somebody at the eighth hour, or whatever it was, I probably would not get out of bed. <laughs> oh, no, my, my teammates are counting on me. So that's what motivates people to go. It's because the group is coming. Someone's waiting for them, yeah. Now, in your case, or in the case of Multiply Myeloma, mm -hmm. something else is driving you. Yeah, the mission and the charity. We had applications to join our team. I wanted to be very intentional about the individuals we chose. I wanted them to truly be invested in our mission or raising mental health awareness. So. I think that's what helps these individuals get up early for those long runs on their own is just they're invested in Still I Run and raising mental health awareness. That's why I really love these individuals. I can't wait to give them all a hug if they're huggers <laughs> when I see them because there's nine of them. Like I said, they raised close to 39000 on their own, just the nine of them. In fact, I think your initial goal was 25. It was. They, now you're going to cross over 40. I know. I, they're just incredible. I can't wait to meet all of them. <laughs> Well, this is United States, uh, because they're all over the country. We're very generous. And if somebody else doing the heavy lifting, I can write them a check. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, on that note, I'm writing you guys a check. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me.